Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Oh, well, I want to thank you all for such wonderful worship. I want to thank the Lord for infusing you with His Holy Ghost power. For you to be able to worship in such a way that you don't worship for yourself. I, heard, I felt that we were worshiping for the Lord. For His pleasure. For, for Him to have that sweet smell of Savior of worship unto Him. Praise God. And you know, we sometimes we don't give credit where credit is due for those of us who lead us into worship. And if you know, you know we all start somewhere. And sometimes we come from different places and we come to a church as beautiful as this one. And we have a praise team and a praise team leader as beautiful as this one, these ones are. And we have to learn how to acclimate ourselves to, to the culture of the worship that, that has been uh, created here on the, on the pulpit. And I just want us to give a hand to Brother Perez for his job and how he's doing with the worship and leading the worship and doing the medley of songs together. And I just think he's doing fantastic. We just want to give him a, a praise. Thank you, Jesus. Um, it's not easy being on that computer. You never know sometimes where, where the praise team's going to go, where the pastor's going to go, and you've got to be on top of it. So we also need to appreciate Sister Virgie's job when she's here. She does a lot. And when, she see, when you see her next time, tell her, we missed you so much. As much as we miss Brother Pete, we missed you. Don't say more, though. Don't say we missed you more than Brother Pete, because you know, we, we, we love them equally. Praise God. They're a team. Thank you, Jesus. Well, we're going to get ready for the Word of God, and I ask if you can, that you stand for the Word of God this morning. And we have a few scriptures here, and, uh, but we're going to start out, before we pray and get into the message, we're going to start out with our, our first verse. And I want us to go to Luke chapter 12. You're not going to have it on the words, because I'm the Word man, and I can't do both. So I'm preaching, and you're going to have to open up your Bibles Saints, ladies and gentlemen, open up your Bible to Luke chapter 12, and we're going to read verses 49, hallelujah, through 53. And it goes like this. This is Jesus speaking. And I will come to send fire on the earth. And what will I if it be already kindled? But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how am I straightened till it be accomplished? Suppose you then that I am come to give peace on the earth? I tell you no, but rather division. You think I came to give peace, Jesus says? Uh-uh. I haven't come in this context, he's saying, I didn't come to give peace. We'll talk about the context in a moment. I came to bring division. From herefore there shall be five in one household divided. Three against two and two against three. The father shall be divided against the son and the son against the father. The mother against the daughter and the daughter against the mother. The mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Praise God. Jesus came to bring a division. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you. We ask that you bless this word, that you bless yeah, these lips of clay, Lord, that your truth be told, that your truth be understood, that your truth be concise and clear, and that we all wait, walk away from here today, Lord, changed in our minds, renewed in our minds about the signs of the times. In Jesus' name we pray, all to your glory, all to your honor, in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. you may be seated. Jesus just laid forth why he's here. He's here not to cause confusion, but division. And that division is by his mere presence and his mere act of mercy and grace that he had as God the Son on the cross. He knew that the cross, his, that himself and the work that he did on the cross would be a dividing point between the wolves and the sheep, between the wheat and the chaff, between the good and the evil. He knew that that was going to come to place. And that's the context in which he is speaking, because there are those that accept Jesus, and there are those that reject Jesus. Amen? 
But see, in order for us to be able to navigate this world and navigate this time and navigate this church and navigate ourselves, Jesus wants us to have a GPS. Any of you drivers, anybody use a GPS system here? I got a GPS, praise God. Don't look at it while you're driving, please. Don't, don't, don't turn away from, from your, your windshield, you know, your drive, and, and look away while you're driving. Somebody could get hurt. The GPS, put it, put it on its voice so that it tells you where to go, so that you don't have to continually look at it. Well, God has a GPS, and it's actually called God's Positioning Spirit. God's Positioning Spirit. Instead of the Global Positioning System, it is God's Positioning Spirit. And Jesus is going to tell us in certain scriptures and through this message how we navigate the times, the church, and ourselves in this time of division. We are in a time of division, beloved. We are in a time of division not only in this world in regards to politics in the United States, uh, we are divided by precepts. We're divided by what morality is or isn't to certain people. Because instead of having an objective reality, we have a subjective reality. And instead of having an objective morality, we have a subjective morality. Which basically means how I see it is how I see it. How you see it is how you see it. And what is is what it is to me. And what it is is what it is to you. Which is completely false. Because there was only one way, there was only one truth, there was only one life, and that life is Jesus Christ. And anything else God says in his word is not the truth. Even if it's partial truth, if it doesn't include Jesus as Lord and Savior and King of Kings and Lord of Lords, it is only a half truth and therefore it's a lie. The devil, he enjoys working with half truth. That's how he deceives most of us, is with half truth. Truth, praise God. So here we have this global positioning system that needs to be transferred from the world into the spirit because it has to be God's positioning spirit. And we're going to learn that we have a terrain in this life. We have a land. We have a road. It's a terrain that we must go on. We have a vehicle in this life. And we have a driver in this life. Praise God. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm a passenger. I'm a passenger. I'm a passenger because Jesus has got the wheel. Hallelujah. You're just a passenger. But your terrain is the times in which you live. That's what you're navigating. We're navigating in the times in which we live. And our vehicle is the church. That's our vessel in this world, the body of Christ. That's the vehicle that we're driving this terrain in. Praise God. And the driver is Jesus of the vehicle, and we're the passengers. Hallelujah. And this is how we navigate this life, and this is how we navigate this time. And we're going to learn how we're going to deal with the shifts and divisions that are going on in society today in our Western culture, because that's what we know. Praise God. But we're going to look at it through some magnifying glasses that are going to help us understand really what our position is at this time, as opposed to what our destination is in the future, whether it be tomorrow or in 20 years or in 50 years. First of all, in order to go anywhere, you've got to know certain things. You've got to know who you are and what you're capable of. Amen? Amen. Uh, not, not everybody just gets into a, a big rig, uh, a semi-truck, and says, I can drive this, and jumps in and drives it safely. Amen? You've got to know who you are and what your capabilities are and what your gifts are and what kind of, what kind of vehicle best suits you so that you can be the best driver that you can be. You also need to be trained to drive the vehicle that you're in. Amen? And so you need to know who you are. And number two, you need to know where you're going. Every driver needs a destination. When you got in your car this morning, what was your destination? The church. Amen. And, and in order to get to your destination, you had to get on the what? On the road. But you had to get in your car first, praise God. And then you had to get on the road. And then you had to have your, your, you had to know where you were going. 
You have to know where you're going. And, and you got to know how you're going to get there. How are you going to get there? I'm going to get there with this vehicle. I got to make sure the vehicle has enough gas. I got to make sure everything you know, runs properly. If any of you are in the driving business, you know you got to do a pre-trip, which means you got to check out your car, make sure everything's going good with it. Check your tires, check your oil, check your water, make sure everything's good. Check your horn, check your signals, make sure they work before you take off. Not everybody does that. So you got to know who you are, where you're going, and how you're going to get there. And then you got to know what you're going there for. Nobody goes into their vehicle to go to uh, uh, the gas station and not know that they're going for gas. Okay? Or go to the store not knowing that they're going for groceries. You know where you're, you got to know where you're going and why you're going. You know? Why are you going to the store today, Pastor? Because Judy said, we're out of milk and I ain't driving. You are. Have a nice time. And so the pastor says, okay, I guess I'm going to go get milk. And so now he knows he's got, he's got who he is, where he's going. He knows how he's going to get there, and he knows what he's going for. Amen? We need to know these same things. And so, but first, we need to know the terrain that besets us so that we can be equipped for the terrain. We can be equipped for the road ahead. Let's go to Luke chapter 12, and we're going to read 54 through 57. This is the terrain in which we live. Luke 12, 54 and 57. 54 through 57. And Jesus said also to the people, when you see a cloud rise out of the west, right away you say, there comes rain or a shower, and so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say there will be heat, and it comes to pass. You hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it that you do not discern this time? And even why even of yourselves do you not judge what is right? What is right? When, when we are getting ready to take off for work in the morning, we turn on the news and we look, we look at the weather. We want to see what kind of weather is going. We know the road that we drive down every day, but it can change in an instant with traffic and weather. So we check the traffic and the weather in the morning to see what we need to do to get to work safely and on time. And you have these meteorologists and these traffic people, and they've got all these maps and all these things. But you know what? They can tell when it's going to be sunny and when it's going to be raining by what they see. But what they don't have control of is nature itself and people themselves. And so all it takes is one person to look away from the steering wheel and scold their child while they're driving. And then there's an accident that wasn't there two seconds before. Two seconds after you had the, the, the person on the news say it was clear. Well, now it's not clear. And it happened while you were on that road. So you can't count on the world's or the flesh's or the enemy's positioning unit because it's going to be false. It cannot be 100% effective. It cannot be 100% true. As a matter of fact, many times the meteorologists have said, it's going to rain tomorrow, and then it doesn't. Or they say, it's going to rain at 5 in the morning, and then it doesn't rain until noon because they didn't take into account something that came from a low pressure or a high pressure from a different direction, and it changed everything. Amen? You will never, ever call a meteorologist a prophet. Praise God. Because they cannot perfectly tell you how it's going to be. But Jesus says you can. Jesus says you can, you can judge these things generally, but yet you can't discern the time in which you live. What is the time in which we live? It is the road on which we're, America is going down. What road is America going down? Socialism. The road of socialism, which leads to, what does it lead to? It leads to destruction eventually, right? It leads to government control over you. And actually, uh, it, it, it probably will end up, will be like Venezuela. Broken. And all the government officials rich. And we, we're going to be poor. All of us. All of us. Amen. And so this road that we're going down, it's an immoral road. And, but see, they, they want to choose their morality. They want to choose their morality. A professor in, in, in um, uh, theology was once teaching a class to a bunch of kids uh, in regards to philosophies. 
And morality is not a philosophy. And, and what is truth is not a philosophy. But that's what many over the centuries, you know, Plato and Confucius and all these other folks, they, they're, they're trying to put together what reality is. And so this professor says, okay, I got a piece of chalk. This piece of chalk is not a piece of chalk. And all the students clapped and were like, yeah, that's right. Because it's the, the chalk is what you want it to be. The chalk is how you see it to be. And so he told everybody, you're wrong. You're wrong. Can I get somebody here with a brain? And it happened to be that there was a bishop from this school that was in this theological class that was actually about philosophy. And, and the bishop stood up and he said, I can't make sense of any of that. And so the professor said, you're the smartest man in the room. Absolutely. You can't. It's nonsense. This piece of chalk is a piece of chalk. Whether we call it what we want to call it, the meaning of the word is what it is and defines what it does. And it writes and it's made out of this material. Therefore, it's a piece of chalk. Look, if I tell somebody, well, there's a cliff coming up. And I just don't believe it's a cliff. So I'm going to walk right over it. And I'm not going to fall and die because I don't believe it's a cliff. Well, guess what's going to happen when I walk off the cliff? I'm going to fall and I'm going to die because no matter what we think about, no matter what we think about uh, subjectively, it's the object that's going to do the work. And we're going to end up dealing with the laws that God has put in place. In this case, gravity. <laughs> okay. One way or another, reality is going to be defined by God. Whether the world that believes in him or the world that doesn't believe in him, it's going to come to you and God, me and God. And we're going to realize that it is God. It is Jesus. Oh, it is Jesus. <laughs> and when we come to that realization of truth and we come to that realization, then we can understand the terrain that we're in. We're in the terrain. We're in a world where people say, a baby is not alive even after it's born. No, we refuse to believe that it's a, lot, it's a living being and we, can, and we can kill it. How can you kill something that's not alive? The very precept of killing something is taking its life. But we got people in Hollywood that are saying now that if you're for uh, pro-life, then you're a racist. And, you, and you're MAGA hat. You're, you're, a, you're, a, uh, uh, you're the MAGA hat is the new white hood. Okay? You're all a bunch of, uh, of, of uh, German racists, white supremacists. Okay? Because you don't let a woman choose. What is the difference between the woman having the baby killed after it's born or having the baby and then throwing it in a dumpster? That's what we were doing before. What's the difference? The baby in the dumpster may have a chance to live, actually. Now we're just killing them. Where's the morality? It's, it's, sub it's subjective. It depends on what your morality is and what their morality is. It can be two different things. Well, guess what? That's always going to bring division. You're never going to agree on anything. And what the devil tries to do is he tries to make you see other people's subjectiveness, other people's beliefs and their morality, and you just as, as a person and as a church to be able to say, well, okay, that's your belief. I'm cool with that. No, you can't be cool with that. You are a follower of the king of the universe. You're not okay with abortion. You're not okay with, with people being able to have same-sex marriages. You're not okay with that. You're not okay with, with doing the things that God says not to do. And you're not okay with the world going down that road, even though you're on that road with them. Because when I'm going down the road, I'm a school bus driver, and you're not. You hear what I'm saying? And I'm not saying, so I'm glad I'm so high and mighty and you're so... No, 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 no. I'm saying my license requires much more responsibility, much more training, and much more attention to detail to be the safest driver for the children that are on my bus. So I have way more knowledge about driving than most people. And so I am held to a higher standard by God himself. To maintain my license and maintain the safety of my children on my bus. 
You have a license which is the Holy Ghost. You have a license that's been given to you, the power of God inside of you. And you have much more responsibility as you walk, as you drive down these roads, and drive down these ideas, and drive down these, these twisted moralities. You've got to be able to navigate them, and you've got to be true to what, to what license you have. You are pro-life, pro-marriage, pro-man and woman in marriage. You are pro-family. You are pro-God. You are pro-Jesus. You are for all the things that God is for. You're against sin. And you are for righteousness. And you've got to be able to navigate that terrain. You've got to be able to navigate that road. Because every other person that's driving around you is most likely not... Like you, doesn't have the same license that you have. And they're going to do some crazy stuff on the road of life in front of you. And you've got to make a decision how you're going to react to it. How you're going to speak to it. If you're going to rebuke it. If you're going to lift it up in prayer. If you're going, how, what are you going to do when somebody rams into you and says, get out of my way. And, 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 and you end up in a, you know, in a scuffle. Praise God. We got people, crazy people, crazy Christians. They're driving down the road and somebody cuts them off and they honk their horn at them. Uh, uh, uh. You're living in a terrain, you're living in a society where that vehicle will come, turn around, come around, catch you on the corner and shoot you in the head. We're taught, we're taught that we use our horn as least as possible, only when we're backing up. On the school bus. And if we see something, we want people to know that we're there, so we honk our horn. And, and very lightly, honk, honk, hey, I'm here. Not, get out of my way, you moron. We don't do that. Because then you ask for, you got to know the terrain. You don't go into somebody's house and do what you want. Because if that house is the house of the devil, they're going to kill you. And you're driving down these roads every day, and everybody on these roads wants to kill you. Some of them don't even realize that they're working for the enemy. Most of them don't. But they're out there to be distracted by the enemy to take away life. To kill, to steal, and destroy. So we've got to be able to navigate our times, folks. Look, you've got to watch the news. Don't turn away from it. But don't only watch the news that's on the TV. Listen to your Christian radios. Listen to CRN. Listen to Ameri One America Network. Listen to the things that tell you Christian values and Christian views and, and the way America was when we were by our founders, as our founders created it. You have questions about better ways to learn about things that are happening in our times? Come talk to me. I'll give you some resources and news channels and online as well as on TV and books and, and radio stations to listen to that will actually tell you the, the truth in regards how it how it forms with the uh, Christian values. How it's in alignment with our Christian values. Amen. Praise God. So you've got to know the terrain that you're in, but you've got to have the right vehicle. And the vehicle that you have is the house of God. Amen. Going down this Christian road, going down these evil roads, we got to have a house. They're going to try to take this house away from us. And so the house might have to move from the house of God that's in this big building to the house of God that's in the pastor's house. I hope you got enough food, pastor. <laughs> hope you got enough chairs. And, and only God will let us know when it's time to, to get out of Dodge and get back in the homes. But it's coming soon. It's coming soon. Praise God. They're removing pastors left and right for having, for having a, uh, a mentality of a man is a man and a woman is a woman. Amen. They're, they're bringing in alternate lifestyle people into the, into the ministries or they'll sue. And churches are opening up their doors and opening up their pulpits and opening up their classrooms to people who live against the will of God, performing the works of God in the house of God, which is, in my opinion, an abomination. But I can't say that out there without getting repercussions. But I did at work one time. Somebody was pestering me at work. And this person at work is always, always pestering me and making... Making light and making fun of how my wife and I interact at work and, and how we're a couple and how we're tied to the hip and, and uh, you know, how I'm always doing these certain things for her, opening doors for her and dropping her off in her vehicle and all kinds of stuff. And why do you do that? Because I'm her husband. Because I'm her husband and she's my wife. 
Well, she's not the weaker vessel. I'm like, yeah, no, you know, if you know my wife, she ain't. She is not the, 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 the you know, in, in regards to strength-wise. Have you ever gotten punched by my wife? She punched me in the arm once. I went, wow, I better, I better keep my P's and Q's. But that doesn't mean that, that she's not who God says she is. She's a woman and I'm a man. And so she enjoys me being a gentleman to her. And that's what we're supposed to be. And now we have these ministers, these pastors that are out there teaching young men how to be men. And they're getting fired because it's hate speech. It's hate speech against who? The effeminate men. The men that want to be effeminate. That don't want to be manly men. And there's levels of manly men. I mean, even in the Bible, right? You got, J you got uh, Jacob and Esau, okay? But they were both men, okay? Praise God. I, I, I wager to say that even the women of the, of the New Testament and the Old Testament, those women, they were strong women. Amen? Amen? They didn't just go to the, to the laundry and throw the laundry in the basket and, and the thing and press the button. Man, they were, they were buff women. They were out there working hard. Okay, but they were still women. They still knew who they were in God. They still knew their gender. They still understood that they were fearfully and wonderfully made by a creator. And so now we have this house that's being divided because the world is coming in. And saying, oh, no, you can't say that. that. That's bigotry. No, you can't say that. That's hate speech. No, you can't say that. You can't say that. You know what? The world tells me what I can't do. And Jesus tells me to give unto Caesar what is due unto Caesar. But if it ain't due unto Caesar, I ain't giving it to Caesar. And if it belongs to God, I'm giving it to God. And this mouth and this body and these eyes belongs to God. And I'm going to preach the word of God and not any other gospel that other people want to hear so that they can live a lifestyle that they want to live. And so we're going to end up in prison, folks. Maybe we will see it in our time. I don't know. But we're definitely having ministers that are being removed, pastors that are being removed for speaking the truth. Praise God. So we got to choose our house of God wisely. When you're about to go on the road, and, and you've got to pick a good vehicle, a vehicle that's fit to, to take the journey. You've got to do your inspection of the vehicle. You've got to make sure it's the correct vehicle. If you're going down just streets, then you have a decent vehicle for that and the tires for that. If you're going off-roading, you've got to have the tires for that. If you're going to be like me and have wheelchairs in my, in my bus with uh, quadriplegic and paraplegic uh, children, you've got to have straps and you've got to have places for them to be secure. And, and you've got to have all the, the stop sign that comes out and the red lights and the yellow lights. You've got to have all that going on in order to make your journey safe. Amen. And so you want to have a church that you're safe. You're safe. I don't know about you, but I feel really safe here. Why do I feel safe here? Because nobody pulls any punches here. They tell it like it is. The pastor in love will preach what he preaches. Pete Jr. in love will preach what he preaches. And sometimes that will cut, cut us to the quick, right? Uh, we got Brother James, we got, we got uh, Brother Daniel, uh, we, we got all the, the women that are teaching the children about the Lord, uh, the Ninos and the, and the Jovenes. We've got all these people that are, are chosen by God, by the pastor, through the pastor, in order that we keep the truth of God alive. And so there's not a compromise here in this church. You can feel the love, but you can also feel the righteousness of God. And it's not ours. It belongs to Jesus. But it's here because you can feel the spirit of God in this church. And people come and believe me, it scares them. And then they go. They don't leave because they come in and they see a bunch of hypocrites. They leave because they, leave, they see a lifestyle that they're not willing to embrace. Yes, there are a bunch of nice people, but boy, are they disciplined. I'm not ready for that. That's why a lot of people don't come to church. So then they go down, they go to the church down the street. And it might even be an apostolic church down the street or a Pentecostal down the street that doesn't have as many rules and regulations or, 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 or lifestyles of the people that show modesty. Because I, I'm sorry, you can, you can go anywhere to any church and you can see a lack of modesty everywhere. And I'm not talking just a little bit of makeup to make you look nice or a little bit of hair color. I'm talking about, oh, well, they're Pentecostal apostolic and, and they need to wear dresses. Have you seen how they wear some of their dresses? Oh, my Lord. I have it because i got to look away. I'm like, honey, we got to go. You know? 
Praise God. We were, quote unquote, visiting this other church. And they had a, a female guitarist who sat on a, on a, 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 a stool with a short dress and sat there playing the guitar on her lap. Anybody that looked up there that was any kind of man or any kind of woman and kept looking, they should have felt shame. They should have felt shame. we got to guard our eyes and guard ourselves. And we have to have a church that backs us up in our faith, in our convictions, church. A lot of times we, we ask for the church to be perfect for us. Okay? Really what you need is sound doctrine, right? That is completely Bible and nothing else. Jesus and, and nothing else. Grace and mercy and nothing else. Okay? And, and that, that brings about obedience and sacrifice and nothing else, right? And it brings about a re how you react to that truth in regards to your way that you walk, because Jesus is your, is your, is your Lord now, he's your master now, right? Yeah. And so your response to that holiness of God is holiness in your own life, holiness in our own lives. And that holiness scares people away, but it shouldn't. We don't make people be holy, Jesus helps you be holy, hallelujah. Just let God do his work. Hallelujah. But we got to come to a place where we have fellows that have the same mind and, this, and women who have the same mind in Christ. Keep the same mind. How can you have the same minds if you don't at least respect the severity of holiness in other people or the lack of holiness in some people? You've got, to, you've got to be able to navigate that within the church because your vehicle has a lot of different bells and whistles. The church has a lot of different bells and whistles. Some churches have in, in incredible uh, sound systems and, and, and computerized this and that where, where they got videos playing while they're, while they're singing, while they're dancing, while they got, the, they got so many things going on. You're wondering if you're in a church or if you're you know, at a show. Okay. Some churches, they have orators that are only teachers, and all they do is teach, 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 teach. There's no, there's no power in, in regards to uh, emotion and charisma in their sermons, but they are dead on with the Word of God. Okay? And, and people like some, sometimes they like those churches, Bible study churches that are just all about Bible study. Some, some people like the charismatic churches that are all about charisma. Amen? And just jumping around in the Holy Ghost and running wild. Okay? But there's a church for everybody in, in, our, in our apostolic you know, frame uh, of, of belief. There's a church. You can find a church anywhere. But most people go for the bells and whistles because they don't want to roll down the window with a crank. You know? They don't want to have to adjust their mirrors or sit in their seat when it's cold. And so we get so, so focused on the plushness and, and, the, and that the church is... With the times. But wait a minute, I just said we gotta judge the we gotta navigate times that are that are horrendous. And can you really count on on your, your computers, uh, the, the, the bus's computer or the or, or your vehicle's computer? Do you know they go bad? Have you ever been in a car when the computer started going cattywampus and all of a sudden your windows go up and down, up and down, up, and you're not touching anything? And then your, your car starts honking or something and because water got in it. And so, you know, you've got to be able to trust your vehicle. And I don't know about you, but sometimes the more technology you have, the more that can go wrong. And so we get so accustomed to these TVs and we get so accustomed to these microphones. We get so accustomed to, you know, these, these things that, that have, have electronic amplification that what would happen if we had a blackout? I'm looking at this church on TV, you know, and I'm going, man, these guys got all the smoke and all the mirrors and all the, the computers and all the words and all the this and that. And if, if, if there was a, a power outage, what would they do? People would probably leave. What would happen in this church, in our vessel, in our vehicle? We can turn off the outside. We can turn off the technology. We can turn off all the bells and whistles and still be an awesome car because we're founded with the brick and mortar that is the brick and mortar of Jesus Christ. And if everything fails, we'll sing a cappella. And if everything fails, Brother James will bring up his guitar and play it 
um, without being plugged in. And he'll just play, and, and, and Brother Angel the same, if I could give him credit too. He plays a mean guitar now. He learned a lot, praise God, if you hear him on Wednesdays. And the pastor's going to sing his song, whether there's backup or not. Same with Brother Pete. We don't need backup. All we, we don't need the bells and whistles. We just need a good church that believes in Jesus, that he's the way, the truth, and the life, and there's no one but him. And so we have our terrain and we have our vehicle. It's important to have a good vehicle. You need to maintain respect for each other and unity with each other. If somebody's got convictions that are a little bit crazy for you, you know, you, know, you got a woman here, and she's, so, she's so crazy, she don't pluck her eyebrows. Amen. She looks like Bert from Sesame Street. Okay. And, and, and because she just isn't, you know, she's not going to touch it. And that's how she's going to be. Hey, man, that's her conviction. Let her have it. You don't have to have the same conviction, but at least have love for those who have higher or lower standards in regards to our standards. But what do we do? The pastor says, you don't, you don't scold them and attack them. You just live your example, how you live for the Lord, how the Bible tells you as you, under, as you understand it. And let them ask the questions and you tell them why you do what you do. Brother Steve, why, why when, they, when, they, when they allow Wednesday nights to be dressed down, why did, you, why did you dress down for a couple of days and then come back with a shirt and tie? Well, because... It was supposed to be dressed down. Then I showed up with a, you know, a sweater with no tie and just long sleeves and dress pants. That's dressed down for, for church on a Wednesday. But everybody else still came with their ties because they refused to dress down for God. They refused. So I'm looking at all my examples, all my mentors, and they showed up with shirts and ties. It lasted for two weeks. Woo. Lasted for two weeks. Then I ended up coming back with a shirt and tie. Why? Because of my examples. Not because I wanted to be like them, exactly like them, because they're individuals with individual gifts and, and abilities and anointings on their lives, but because they set a standard, and I saw that standard, and I said, well, if this is the standard and we're going to be together, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have that standard too. And so there went the dress down Wednesdays. There it went. Not my choice. But my sacrifice. Wearing this tie is a sacrifice, folks. It's a sacrifice. Wearing these dress, these clothes, it's a sacrifice for us men. You don't think so. It ain't easy. Amen. It ain't easy dressing like this. We know what we look like. You know? We all, either we look like we're, we're mafia, praise God, or we look like we're ministers. People can look at you and say, oh yeah, oh yeah, that's obviously a pastor. But I have to tell them, I'm not a pastor. I just dress like this because... My men don't like going, you know, our, our, our ministers don't like dressing down. Praise God. But I do it out of love, yeah. out of respect for the elders. Pastor didn't say I had to come fully dressed. He said you could dress down. But the other men, they refused. Old school. Man, hallelujah. You know what? There's so much old school here, it's a shame that there's not more new school to learn from the old school. And then we get to our third point. Which is you got to know your terrain. You've got to have a good vehicle. You got to know the evil world and the good church that you're in. You got to you got to have your driver and your passengers. John seven twenty four. John seven twenty four. And this is powerful because again Jesus is speaking these things. I like it when when we go to those red letters. These are Jesus's words. Thank you, Lord. John 7, 24. Judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Judge not according to the appearance. Don't judge me based on what I do with my body in regards to how I dress, but rather pay attention to how I conduct myself how I speak, how I treat others, how I treat my wife, how I treat the brethren, how I treat myself, how I respect or, no, or don't respect, how I honor or don't honor. Those are the things, these are actions that we look at. And even then, we don't judge based merely on actions because you can be, see, be deceived with people's actions. They can be fake, but they can't be fake in a good, in a good car, in a good vessel. 
You can pretend that a car is an off-road vehicle for only so long because they're going to take it off-road and then the wheels are going to fall off. Right? Because it never was an off-road vehicle. Just like you as a Christian. You can fake it for so long until, right. until your wheels fall off and they find out you're, you're not an off-road vehicle. You're, you're a street vehicle. But you've got to be who you are and be honest with yourself and with your brethren. Honest with God so that everybody can work at the different levels that we are in grace. See, here's the thing about being a driver. There are different levels of professional drivers. Some professional drivers just have a Class B license, which lets, with, with, lets them drive bigger vehicles that can haul certain things, but not people. Other people have licenses that allows them not only to drive bigger vehicles, but have a certain amount of passengers to be able to drive around. Then there's another level of, of license that allows them to drive bigger vehicles even, the semis that you see, and drive bigger loads. And there's other limousine drivers that can drive different people, okay, those are different licenses. And then you have the top, 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 top license, which I don't know if it will surprise you, is a school bus license. Because somewhere in this fallen society, there's still some shred of caring about the safety of our children as they're being transported from home to school. And so to be a school bus driver, you've got to have your passenger, your class C, your class B, your school bus. You've got to have your first aid. You've got to have all this different training dealing with uh, special needs. There's, all the, there's, there's tons of things you've got to do every, every five years, every two years, and annually. We've got to do all the time to stay fresh, stay trained. We've got to do a certain amount of training hours every year to, to, to be the best drivers that we can be. And even with that, there's bus drivers that, okay, we're in the schoolyard now, and it says five miles an hour. And there's school bus drivers going through there that are not going five miles an hour with the same license that I have. So I can't judge them based on the fact that, well, they're a school bus driver just like me, so they must drive the same. No, because their convictions are different in regards to speed, in regards to being able to navigate in certain areas like me. I drove for Apple and Google. And so I drove these sprinters, and I had time limits that I had to make it. So I learned how to legally get up to speed as fast as possible. And if there's a speed limit, you get, back, you get to it in a safe manner as fast as you can, and then tap out at that minimum uh, speed limit, and then get where you need to go. And I learned how to know my vehicle and anybody who knows me prior to this will laugh because they saw me drive before and were like, whoa, this guy's crazy. But now I'm not. Now I know the size of my vehicle, the length of my vehicle, the height of my vehicle. I know where I can go and where I can't go. And there's other bus drivers who, they won't go where I go. Because they say, well, the buses won't make it there. And their buses are smaller than mine. Mine's bigger. It's a wheelchair bus. And I say, you can't make it through there? But we're not all the same. Their conviction of safety in that manner is stronger than mine. They don't, they're, they're not counting on their judgment of their vehicle. They just don't even want to mess with it. And they don't have to. Just like when you come up to a red light. You can turn in certain areas on a red light. Okay? But some people, they don't. They just wait for the signal. And guess what? It's in their right to wait for that signal if that's what makes them safe. And so what we have here is we have individuals, instead of basing each other's total life experience and, and their unity with us based on what we see, we base on relationship. I can't know what is in those bus drivers' heads and why they do what they do unless we converse and talk about things and why we do what we do, how we do, and why I feel safe for doing certain things and they don't feel as safe. And I don't feel safe driving, you know, speeding, but they, they go 10 miles over the speed limit. Okay? Um, who takes... Who takes certain things into, into account? Like, okay, uh, if I open up my stop sign, if I open up my stop sign and I see a car coming up and he's right beside me, he's going to hit my stop sign and knock it off my bus. So i got to wait until he passes before I open up my stop sign to let my child in because I'm, I've got to constantly be aware. I've got to constantly be aware. Some bus drivers, they don't do that. They know they're right, and we are allowed to just flip on our stop sign anytime we want. And so they use that right to do what they want. But the thing is, if somebody hits your stop sign, they're in a load of trouble. And I don't want to put somebody in that position that's, you know, all of a sudden there's a stop sign in front of you because you're right beside the bus. So I have some grace. 
and I say, I'll let you pass before I let the, let the child on. But here's the problem. I can't do that if the kid is already on her way or his way to the bus. i got to put out that stop sign as soon as that kid, I have that kid in my sight. So I've got to navigate that myself. And you're going to judge not just who I am by what you see. You're going to talk to me about why you see what you see and why I do what I do. So that we don't judge people with unrighteous judgment. I don't care about the uh, Sunday school teacher today. He'll just have to wait. <laughs> you've got your terrain. You've got your vehicle. And you've got your driver. Okay? You've got a special license. It's the Holy Ghost. But the great news for us as drivers, as we stand and get ready to be dismissed, is that Jesus takes the wheel of our bus. Jesus takes the wheel of our vehicle. Jesus has the wheel of our church in today's society. Jesus has the wheel. And so he knows all. He is omnipresent. He is omniscient. Amen. He is omnipotent. He is God himself in the flesh. And so, and he, his Holy Spirit is in us to help us navigate. And so all we got to do is listen and see Jesus in his word. Listen, do his word, read his word, and we'll know how to navigate our vehicle in this world. Because it's our responsibility to help the pastor navigate the vehicle, which is the body of Christ, this church, in the world. How do we navigate Hayward? How are we dealing with Hayward? How are we dealing with our families? How are we dealing with the word of God in our lives, our individual lives? We can't know these things unless we know our driver. Do you know that the kids on our buses, they come to love us sometimes more than their teachers. And all we do is spend an hour to two hours with them a day. But man, when they come into the bus, oh, Steve, my bus driver, bus driver. Same with my wife and other people. They, the kids end up loving their bus drivers because, it, I'll tell you what, they come from a hard day of school. They're trying to do things and they can't because their bodies are, are special needs and they can't do the same thing other kids can do. They have a different life at home and a different life at school. And, and they want to feel important and they want to feel empowered. And then they come on our bus and we say, hey, buddy, how's it going? And we put them in their car seat or sit them down and we hand them their favorite book because they told us what book they like. And we had our boss go and get it. And so now we got, you know, Clifford the Big Red Dog for some of them and dinosaurs for others. And we we hand them their books, or we put our phone on on um, uh, uh, on the radio and play kids' silly songs, and we're singing, you know, the wheels on the bus go around and around. I know every single word of that song. And we just do things to make them comfortable and happy and feel loved and relaxed so that they can enjoy us on the bus. But do you know why they feel the way they do in a Christian's bus, in a follower of God's bus? Because Jesus has the wheel of the vehicle. Jesus has the wheel of that bus. And they know when they get in there safe. They know that even if all hell comes against that bus, we're going we're gonna to give our lives for those children. They can feel the spirit of the Lord in that bus. We lay hands on our buses, saints. We pray every morning for every bus driver and every bus and every tire and every wheel. We pray and we pray. And still people get hit, but they walk away in the name of Jesus unscathed. Hallelujah. Praise God. We know that God is behind the wheel. And His Holy Spirit tells us where to go. Because the earthly GPS can make mistakes. You can't go by what the world says. That terrain is dangerous. I've been in a GPS situation where we're driving to go somewhere to some lake or something. And there's a place that we're going and it says it's over here. And we get to that place and it says, you've arrived. And we're in the middle of an intersection. <laughs> We've arrived. Well, the GPS didn't take into account that that business has moved 20 years ago and is now over here. But you see, you can't go by the global positioning. You've got to go by the God positioning. Let us stand. Ask yourself these three questions. Who's the driver? What vehicle am I in? And what terrain lies ahead? Who's the driver? What vehicle am I in? And what terrain lies ahead? If you're here today, you're in the perfect spot. You're in the perfect spot. You got to tell your neighbors and your friends. You got to tell your coworkers this church is the perfect spot. 
This church is going to keep you safe. This church is going to keep you in the word of God. This church is going to keep you in alignment with God's will. This church is going to help you when you need help. This church has a pastor who is a, a co-pilot, a co-driver of Jesus and will lead you into the path, Lord, of righteousness. He will lead us and lead those that are out there. And they're going to be different than us. They're going to have different problems than us. Some of us are going to relate to their problems. Some of us are not. But we are going to be the safest vehicle they can be in because Jesus has got the wheel in this bus, which is the house of Hayward. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Who's your driver? Hallelujah. What vehicle you were in? And how are you going to navigate today's world out there? God bless you. Thank God for that message. It hit me this way. You mentioned four wheel drive. I thank God that the wheels get fall. I'm talking about spiritually now. The brothers are secure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to pass the law. The following God would still be the will of this. Not only this. This town, this city, this California, the United States, they would not go through what Brother Steve was saying. He had to go through a lot of training. So, so do we. And we want to get everything it is to be careful with our soul. 